Hello, everybody, and welcome to Two Nighter Tea, How to Talk to Your Kids About Race. We are so excited that you are all here. My name is Robin Gelfenbein, and I've been helping produce um, all of the events and workshops and courses for tonight. And tonight is a really special conversation. We're so thrilled to have you here. I'm just going to give you a quick lay of the land before I bring up our esteemed founder of tonight. Um, but before I do that, I want to show you, like, I've got my tea here, and I want to know what kind of tea you are all drinking. I'm not going to lie. I'm drinking Snapple. So it's not hot tea, but it's good iced tea. All right. So if you've never it been, hello, Lauren. Hello, Liz. Thanks so much for being here. If you have not been to uh, within the Crowdcast event before, just a couple of things. Um, if you have any questions at all, there's a section at the bottom that you can see here. Ask a question. We already got one. Thank you, Liz, for doing that. Uh, so throughout the evening, if you have any questions that come up, drop them in there. I'll also keep an eye in the chat in case you have them too, and I'll transfer them over. Um, also, if you run into any technical problems, I'll do my best to stay on top of that too. And um, and uh, there's like other little fun things that will happen along the bottom. So keep your eyes out for that. So uh, without further ado, I am so excited to, hello, Michelle, to uh, introduce the uh, editor and publisher of uh, Tonight. Uh, she is formerly the editorial director at realsimple.com. She has written and has edited and contributed to Rolling Stone, Refinery29, The Village Voice, and so many more. Please give a huge warm welcome. There's awesome emojis in the chat for Margaret Detweiler. Hey! Hey! Am I toggling? You're toggling. <laughs> you're also in black and white, it seems. What? Well, I'm wearing there black you go. and white. Now you're, this was a, that was a very Wizard of Oz moment you just Wait, had. Wait, <laughs> I'm also like, when we did this tech rehearsal, I was on the other side. This is very disconcerting. Now That's like, okay. I'll be... You know, Crowdcast is crazy. They like to move it around. They do. They do. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Oh, my gosh. It's so Emily. It's good to see you. Gail, Beth. Beth. Regulars. <laughs> Love of regulars and new people. That's always fun. Um, I am so excited for tonight's conversation. Um, uh, Uju and I, Uju Asika, who uh, I'll introduce you to in a minute, but we work together back in the early 2000s, we just realized that we haven't seen each other in like almost 20 years. It's kind of crazy, it like is. what? Yeah. Um, but uh, tonight's a really special night and, and the book that she wrote is absolutely wonderful. So I'm really excited to, to dig in and I think there's a lot of valuable stuff to talk about. Yeah, um, so. yeah so, so uh, this is our second Right, Robin? Second two-nighter tea. Yes. The um, first one was Stacey London, in case you missed it. You can still watch it. You can still watch it. <laughs> still watch it. Um, and uh, that was great. And, um, you know, just so just to tell you all, if you don't know, I think a lot of you do know what tonight is. But for those of you who are quiet and not in the chat. Um, or anybody watching well, the replay. <laughs> or anybody watching the replay. Good point. Good point. Um, we are a storytelling and community platform for Gen X women or women over 40. We like to say grown ass ladies. Um, and over the last several years, we've been doing a lot of storytelling, both live and online. If you go to tonight.com, you can see a lot of our stories. Um, think of us almost like the moth for midlife, right? Um, we also have a weekly newsletter called the to-do list. And we have a new community called Tonighters. And um, we really hope that you will join us there. It's it's an amazing experience, an experiment. We're growing and um, just lots of wonderful women and advice and insights and um, sharing sort of what it's like to be a woman in midlife and going through that together. And it's it's been really great. And we're having events like this. And, and Robin will tell you more later about um, upcoming events that we have. Um, and yeah, so... Um, I think we should probably get into introducing okay. Uju, That's right? right? I'll just say there's a Q&A uh, at, at the end. So if questions come up, drop them in the question section and have a wonderful night. I'll see you in a bit. Okay. All right. So like I said, I've known Uju a while, um, but Uju is a multiple award nominated blogger. Um, she has a blog called Babes About Town, um, which you should absolutely check out as well. Um, she's a digital consultant, 
uh, through moversandshakers.net. And she's the author of the book we're talking about tonight, Bringing Up Race, How to Raise a Kind Child in a Prejudiced Wor World. It was published in 2020 by um, Yellow Kite Hachette UK, and it was just released in North America this past May, just last month by Sourcebooks. Uh, London Evening Standard pick, picked it as the best books for September, 2020. It's available in hardback ebook, audiobook formats on Amazon UK, Waterstones and other good bookshops. Uh, just, she's been getting rave reviews for her books. Book reviews said, timely and important, Uju Asika's bringing up race is imperative reading for all expectant, new and old timer parents. Filled with personal stories, expert advice and advice from fellow parents. Bringing up race is a call to arms for all parents to start the conversation and raise the most inclusive generation yet. Um, that was from Evening Standard, actually. Um, and I would say, you know, um, as somebody who's not a parent myself, I actually, you know, I'm an aunt and I am a human in the world. And I felt like this applies to all of us. So um, I'd love to bring up um, the wonderful Uju Asika to talk about her book. Toggle it on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a slight panic moment like, oh no, I'm gonna toggle myself out of the chat. <laughs> we have for, big problems. For, for everybody, yeah, there's like this thing that you have to do to like go live. It's like toggle and it's very like panic and dancing. It's like toggle. Yeah, this is not your usual Zoom. <laughs> it is not. It is not. But it's fun. We we dig it. So welcome, yeah. Uju. It's so welcome. Nice to you. Thanks so much for that introduction. And it is just amazing to be here and to yeah be on a chat with you almost twenty years later, which is crazy. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah we work together at AOL, which is like that doesn't even. I mean, I guess your <laughs> AOL still exists. Does it exist? I'm not even sure. Yeah, uh -oh. <laughs> but we we had fun there. Um, so like I said, you know, I, this is here, let's just, I'll hold up the, the book is behind you. I've got, whoops, wrong way. Got it here. Um, it's a tremendous, oh, there, we both got it. <laughs> it's a tremendous book. Um, it's what I found so amazing was how it's highly readable. And I think that is a credit to your storytelling. Um, you, you really share stories of your own life, of your life with your kids. Um, and I think it just brings it, it truly brings it to life in a way that is palatable for anybody. Um, and it's got just like lots of practical advice too. Um, how did you, what did you, um, how did you come up with the idea for the book? And I know you talk a little bit about it in the book, but for the audience, tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book. Yeah, so the idea was kind of thrust upon me by one of my relatives who, said, oh, you've got to write this book. You know, this is something that people want to read and you're the person to write it. And I was really resistant. I did not want to write a book about race. Um, you know, and I just thought I'm not like a race expert. I'm not an academic. I'm not coming at it as like a critical race theorist. Like, <laughs> what would I have to say? Which is a strange question now because I had so much to say, like I literally, when I turned in the original first draft, I was something like 20,000 words over my word count. <laughs> so I had a lot to say, but back then I just thought I'm, you know, this is not me. But when I sat with it and I really thought about writing it, as you said, from a storytelling perspective and from a lived experience perspective, then it just became natural and it became sort of, important, like I have to do it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's so evident from reading it. It's just, I mean, it sort of spills off the page, you know, and I, I didn't, you know, you don't know what to expect. It's a book about race. You're expecting it to be difficult and challenging. And there definitely is some of that as well, but it's it's just such a good read. And, and I also found some humor in it, like, and maybe that's just because I know you, but I was like, it, there's a lot of charm in it. Um, and just reality. And um, so I, I just really loved it. I'd love for you to read a little bit um, from your book if to kick us off, if you would. Oh, and by the way, before we do that, we since it's two nighter tea, we have our mugs, right? I have my England mug <laughs> for you. <laughs> and yours is very good. Like this better when you giggle. All right. Okay. So this is from, um, a chapter called The First Time, 
and it's really dealing with racial bullying. That's the, the essence of the chapter and what do you do the first time racism comes for your child. And in this section of the chapter, I'm talking about racism and mental health. I had never linked my own struggles with anxiety to growing up as an outsider. I had enough personal trauma to pin it on, from the quiet sorrow of miscarriage to the private horrors of Me Too experiences. And I still carry the grief of losing my father in successive blows, the first stroke at 58 that paralyzed half his body, another stroke five years later that stole his speech and faculties and the final stroke that killed him at 68. Five years since her death, I'm still haunted by my mother passing away suddenly in her sleep. Then I think back to my childhood when I learned to hide so much to hold myself together. Those early days of feeling walled in with children whose faces and voices and family experiences were so alien to me the food I couldn't stomach for weeks, the looks and stares and fingers on my hair and skin, black people caricatured in fiction and movies and history books, my name a sound nobody could pronounce. No wonder my senses remained on alert. No matter how chill and smiley my personality, there's a girl inside who walks a high wire a small part of me easily panics about what if, what's wrong, what's next. Michelle Chai, owner of popular blog Daisy Butter, recalls the stress of growing up as an outsider in an all white area. Kids at school would call her Chinky and make fun of her family's takeout restaurant. When she was 17, she was working at the restaurant when Suddenly a brick came flying through our window, narrowly missing our brand new touchscreen order machine and my head. Michelle said she suffers racially induced anxiety. I stay at home a lot to avoid encounters because racism is on the rise in my area. I feel truly helpless because it is nothing short of terrifying to know you're almost powerless if you're alone. I suffer from regular panic attacks particularly around the fear of a racially provoked attack where I might be pushed in front of a train. A few of these stories hit the news a few months ago and now it has indelibly impacted my life. In 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics released its first major policy statement on the impact of racism on ch children's mental, social and physical health. The results were clear. Racism harms people on multiple levels. It creates anxiety, which in turn causes a variety of ailments. The report links the impact of racism to birth disparities, mental health problems in children and adolescents, and inflammatory reactions leading to chronic disorders caused by prolonged exposure to stress hormones like cortisol. Maria Trent, who co-authored the report, talked about racism as a socially transmitted disease, something we pass on to our children. And you don't have to experience racism directly to feel its negative effects. This type of violence hurts everyone in its path, from oppressors to victims to witnesses. The report states that young adults who were simply bystanders to racism experienced physiological and psychological effects when asked to remember such events that can be compared to what first responders experience after a major disaster. The bully of the world. When I told my children I was writing a book about kids and race, I asked if they had any title ideas. I particularly liked Ezra's suggestion, kids versus racism, beating the biggest bully of them all. Racism is the bully of the world. It comes in many forms. It can shape shift into anti Semitism, tribalism, fascism, Islamophobia, or misogyny. It wants you to believe we are enemies 
that some people are less and deserve less, that there can never be enough for all of us. It can snipe you from a rooftop or sneak up like a drive-by shooter. Indian mom and blogger, Namita Vaish Taylor, recalled walking down the road when a car drove up beside her. There was a boy in the passenger seat. He leaned out the window and shouted, fucking Paki. He couldn't have been more than eight or nine. What got me was that his dad was driving and he didn't say anything to his son. He didn't even look at me. He just carried on driving. Sometimes the bully speaks in the voice of a child, but it is not that child. It is the grown up in the driving seat who doesn't say a word. You see, racism doesn't live in our children. It lives in our silence. It is all the tiny daily acts of hate, mistrust and fear happening under the surface. The face that looks the other way as the car keeps driving, even as the wheels come off. So beautiful. Well, well, clap. <laughs> really, really great. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the kind of writing that just brings so much of this to life and kind of encapsulates the pain as well as, you know, the, there's, you know, joy in there, all, obviously, as well as just um, useful insights. Um, yeah, and I, you know, um, I feel like this is almost like a spoiler alert, but I feel like the ma the pervasive message that I take away is that, you know, in almost every situation, your advice is to address, you know, to not sweep things under the rug, but to address this head on, you know, to not make light of it with children, but to talk about it very directly. Is that, would, that, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. It's one of those things, I think as a parent, you know, parenting is hard. <laughs> so I'm always like, you know, one thing I'm always like with parents, I'm like, give yourself grace. Just like parenting is hard. So even if you've never had a conversation or never thought about having a conversation, don't beat yourself up because you're doing hard work. At the same time, you have to have these conversations. You know, you can't just sail through and expect that your child is going to absorb you know, decency and responsibility and sort of a sense of racial justice. Like there's so many messages that your child is getting from everywhere, from the time they're babies, you know, even before they're babies, actually, if you think about like your child in your room is receiving messages from society about who matters more and who deserves more. And so it's really important for parents to be proactive and just to start talking. And you suggest to start talking as a toddler, is, isn't that right? So very young. As a young. baby. <laughs> as <laughs> a know, baby. Talk to your baby, talk to your bump. You know, talk to the, the um, there's a blogger who runs a blog called Raising Race Conscious Children. And she talked about, you know, when she, her child was a baby, she would read baby books with her child and sort of point out the, people with different color skin and different types of hair and talk about race because, you know, when you're talking with a baby, at least you get to practice and normalize these conversations. You're not worried about whether your baby is going to think, oh, you know, you've said something or, you know, your baby, you're coming out with a microaggression, you know, your baby is just going to be like, whatever. So it's a, really, it's a really good time to actually just start. And, you know, same with the toddler. Parents are really worried about getting it wrong. So you think, oh, I've got to wait until, you know, I've got myself ready and my child is ready. You know, there's never really any readiness with kids mm -hmm. for, for anything. You know, you just have to start and just keep having the conversations. Yep. Yeah, and normalize it, right? I mean, yeah, you yeah. talk about the way we talk about sex with kids sometimes, like, oh, my my new new. This is what you know. <laughs> it's like saying actual words, right? I mean, yes, using the correct <laughs> words. Using, you know, it's like because um, that's what they, you know, sex experts and child therapists will say use the correct term so that your child has ownership of their body and also that it just feels feels normal and also it's right. safer for, for kids because then 
if something happens, they're telling you what happened as opposed to like speaking in euphemisms. And same with race, like you really don't have to speak in euphemisms. You can speak in age appropriate language, but you don't need to be like beating around the bush because it's normal, like it's part of like, you know, right. we're all different. We come from different places. We have different ancestry. We look different. It's a wonderful thing. So yep. you know, yeah. And is that, so here's a question. Is that talk the same for white parents as it is for parents of color, you know, black parents, Asian parents? I think it's inevitably going to be different because for a lot of white parents, it's about even themselves learning to acknowledge race. So as a white parent, you know, you've got to be having these talks with yourself to, you know, have these conversations about yes. what do I understand about race? You know, did I speak to my parents about race ever? Have I spoken to my peers? Have I spoken to like my black friends, my Asian friends, my Latino friends? You know, what kinds of conversations am I having with my partner around race? So, you know, you've got to be talking about it. So it's a whole sort of self-education process. And I think for black parents, um, and a point I keep trying to get across, because a lot of people think that, oh, you know, we're black and we talk about race all the time and we've got it sorted. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> hey, we're not talking about race. Like majority of the time, black right. people are not sitting around having a race conversation but we have to talk about it because it's something that affects us. So unfortunately, a lot of the time, the conversation is around racism and it's around, you know, let's say police brutality, or it's around, you know, how to handle yourself in a racist incident. And for me, I'm like, I don't want that to be the central conversation around race that you're having with your child. It should be something positive. It should be affirmative, it should be like, you know, we are black and this is a wonderful thing and this is your heritage and you know this is where your ancestors came from and this is where your grandparents came from and just sort of telling them the story of who they are can be a really powerful thing for a child and it needs to be sort of filled with love and kindness as opposed to just like you know watch out the world right. is fine. That's great advice. And tell us a little bit about your background because you have lived all over the world, including when I met you in New York, but tell us a little bit about sort of your experience globally growing up. Yeah, yeah, so I was born in Nigeria, um, in Enugu, which is Eastern Nigeria. And then I came to the UK and I went to boarding school at an all white, school. <laughs> I joined my, my oldest siblings at boarding school. And um, yeah, it was kind of a culture shock to say the least. Um, but then we used to go back and forth. So I would go back to Nigeria during the holidays. So, you know, it was very much sort of bicultural upbringing. And then, yeah, I grew up in Britain. So I feel very British. Um, but then I came to, to New York. That's where I, I met you. Um, oh went God. to NYU. <laughs> met you at AOL, so worked in New York for a bit. Then I went back to Lagos, worked in Lagos, then came back to London when I was pregnant. Um, and I wrote about that a little bit in, in yep. the book, in the, intro, in the preface of the book, yeah. And do you think that gives you a different kind of perspective having lived in Nigeria, in London, in New York, like all of those places? Does that give you a particular- Definitely, yeah. like I feel lucky to, have had, you know, this wide ranging experience and to have so many different perspectives on race because, you know, even though it is a lot of the time it's the same story and unfortunately it's a story of pain, but at the same time race and racism look very different in Britain and in America and, you know, even in Nigeria. So, yeah. Yeah. Um uh, I was going to ask, um, what was the toughest chapter for you to write of all of these? Yeah, yeah just the toughest one. <laughs> 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 I'm just thinking. All tough. <laughs> yeah. Like, is there one that you just kind of said, uh, I don't even want to go there, or I find it, this one is kind of hard, difficult to write? Because um, yeah. there were some difficult passages. Um, uh, was it about your friend or your sister um, having that experience where somebody came to the door? Um, 
Yes. Right. Maybe tell about that one. So that was, um, so that, uh, interestingly, that's uh, a chapter called An American Story. And I wrote that for the American edition of the book because that came oh. out um, in May. So that's a new chapter that you don't get in the British um, version. Why I probably gravitated to it, American. You know? <laughs> I was like, I like that chapter. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was interesting because I think what happened when I was writing the book is that you look back on all these experiences and stories and you just think, wow, like people go through so much that you just kind of absorb and shoulder and carry on. Um, when I was writing about my own experiences at school, I, you know, some of it was really painful and I thought this is really like difficult, but how did I get through it? I guess I just carried on. And same thing when I was interviewing contributors, there's one um, story that a lady, she, you know, she's fabulous woman, Andy Oliver. And she shared the story of like when she was at school and this German teacher made fun of her in front of the whole class because of her hair. And it was, you know, she was telling me the story, you know, she cried and I cried and I just thought, <laughs> you know, this is a horrible experience. Like it was really traumatic. That the but, teacher would like bring her up in front of class because she had, was it, she had braids, Yeah, right? she or, had just braided her hair and she was feeling really pretty and she was only about, I don't know, 12 or so, 10, 12, I don't know. And um, yeah, she just, as she walked in, the teacher just turned and was like, oh, what's wrong with your hair? And had the whole class laughing at her. And, you know, okay. even though this is clearly something that, you know, she carries on with life, but it was really painful and it still is painful. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me. I thought there's a lot of sort of unaddressed pain that many people of color are just carrying through, through this world, which, yeah, I think that was one of the harder things to write about. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And um, sort of related to that, I guess, is, you know, one of the things I, your book is so good at is, you know, each chapter at the end has kind of conversation starters where, you know, you have these beautiful stories and these heartfelt, heartbreaking stories a lot of the time. And then, you know, how in a situation like this, how do we deal with things? And one of the, um, you know, one of the things you talk about too, in terms of like microaggressions um, and how, you know, oftentimes microaggressions are so much worse than sort of a bald faced racism where it's like, you know, it's just death by a thousand pinpricks. Um, and how can a child who's kind of constantly getting these things have a template for things to say when, you know, they're made fun of or something happens. And, um, I liked, I just wrote down a few of these, like, you know, some, you have some simple phrases like that's not funny or that's not kind. That's not true. That's not okay. Um, and it, it's like, even as an adult, you know, how do we like to voice that? you know, when somebody is, you know, making fun of you for something to be able to just stand there and say, that's not okay, is very hard. Um, I wonder, sort of tell, talk more about that, like sort of the advice that you give to kids or even adults, you know, in terms of just being able to sort of stand up and say that. So I think it's one of the most important things we could possibly do. Yeah, it's really important and, and it is difficult. And I think it's it's okay, you know, acknowledge that it's difficult. I love that, um, you know, I think it was Maggie Maggie Kuhn who said, um, speak your speak your truth even if your voice shakes. I might be messing up that. Mm. But you know, even if your voice shakes, like speak, say what you need to say and raise your child to say what they need to say. And you can role play it at home. You know, you can have these conversations and you can role play it at home. You can say, oh, if, this, if somebody said this, what would you say? And then you give them something simple. And I just like simple, you know, like having a conversation with your child, keep it simple, keep it direct, keep it factual, you know, and keep it kind. And same thing, like if you're dealing with somebody who's like <laughs> being, you know, an asshole. <laughs> I've already sworn in this. I suddenly thought to right. myself, I'm reading and I'm like, sorry. I hope it's okay. But, oh, um, like, please. <laughs> we say grown ass lady here. Come on. We're all about swearing. I'm like, I don't know. So, um, <laughs> Thank you, yeah, but, you know, if, you're, if you're speaking and someone's being like a racist asshole, you don't have to be an asshole yourself. You know, you can kill them with kindness or you can just be like, you know, 
that's that's racist. Like just be blunt and cut it short. But it's really, really important to see yourself as the kind of person who interrupts these moments as opposed to the kind of person who sits back and says nothing and then hates themselves a little bit afterwards. And, um, mm. you know, there's also pick your moments. I mean, there's times mm. like, for instance, with your child, it's really important to, you know, talk about like gut and safety and do you feel safe in this particular situation to speak up? Sometimes it's not safe. You know, you don't know who you're dealing with. So you've got to know like, is this a safe place to speak up? So sometimes the way to, to be an ally or to support somebody is just to support the person who's experiencing racism as opposed to you know, necessarily having to have a go at a racist or have a go at somebody saying something really mean. You know, sometimes mm. it's just go support your friend and that's, yep. that's the powerful thing you can do. What about when, and I, you have a chapter about this, what about, and you spoke, actually, you just talked about a little bit, but what about when the child is the bully? And we, we just got through with having a bully in chief, right? Which was not a good example for our kids. <laughs> um, and talk about that when, when, you know, your child is the offender. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I think, you know, always my advice is just try not to freak out, try not to engage in labels. Like if your child has, has been accused of bullying, you know, A, try and get them to explain what happened in their own words, try and get every side of the story and then, you know, talk it through, like figure out, okay, what was it that you said? What was it that you were trying to achieve? You know, what do you think? you know, what, like, were you trying to be powerful in the moment? Is it something that's happening, you know, outside of, but a lot of times bullying is about so much more than just that particular moment. Um, but the main thing for me um, in, the, in the book, I sort of recommend as well, is try and get the bully to sit in the shoes of the person, of their victim, like, you know, maybe write a letter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the, in the voice of the victim, talking about how they felt when this bullying happened, you know, just try and provoke an empathy response in your child. And then, you know, don't look at it and sort of say, oh, you've been bad and you've been wrong. And, you know, you're kind of like shutting the door. Just keep asking questions like, why did that happen? And then, okay, there's a lot that we need to learn and let's start learning and let's do it together. So you make it sort of take it, you know, take some of the responsibility, obviously, Maybe you've not had a conversation with your child or maybe you have had conversations with your child. You can't control everything they do, but you can take some of the responsibility in terms of what they learn and how you continue learning about race going forward. That's great. Um, so I was also um, drawn to your chapter called Mixed um, because you know I'm in a um, interracial relationship, mixed relationship with a black oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember, I had you in my blog post where I talked about couples who look alike. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, that's right. Because I was like, wait, we've spoken. I mean, we've yeah. obviously, like, you've been in Two Nighters for a while. And <laughs> anyway, but like, so it's not been really 20 years. But that's why I talked about that post. That's so funny. Yeah, we do kind of look like it's very funny. We actually kind of look like, I mean, I don't know if anybody was. It's weird. I was weird. Like, we do kind of look like. My mom said that. She's like, you're so cool. You look like Mark. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because I mean, and and in his family and my sister in life, I see in the chat. Hello, Valerie. Um, you know, we there's a lot of different mix of people. We have um, somebody who's um, sort of black Japanese American, and we have you know like just a big mix of different kinds of folks. And so I think there are particular um, issues for kids too, and and who are of multiple ethnicities and um, how they're addressed and that awful question of like, what are you? Mm -hmm. um, and you talk a little bit about that and how you address those those issues. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, being mixed heritage is, is a whole other, you know, and there's a few books that have come out recently around the, the mixed experience, but I wanted to dedicate a chapter to it at least because as you said, there can be a lot of 
you know, one of the things I think with race is the amount of pressure that it puts on children, you know, it puts pressure on society as a whole, but you know, specifically children and children, you know, black children, children of color are dealing with a lot of weight. And then as a mixed child, you know, very often that pressure is who do you belong to? Where do you belong? Um, where do you fit? Are you denying one side of yourself if you identify with the other side? Um, you know, then there's all these like weird kind of stereotypes and tropes around being mixed heritage going back to you know, <laughs> well, before um, before sort of uh, mixed people were called all sorts right. of weird, yes, right. just horrendous terms. So um, for me, my whole thing is just like, take some of the pressure off as a parent, like, you know, just let your child identify as they identify and that can evolve over time. So very often your child, I spoke to one lady in the book and she says her daughter right now calls herself brown. She is mixed um, white Jewish and Ghanaian, black Ghanaian, and they're, they're Londoners. Um, but you know, she said her daughter calls herself brown and she said, you know, that's fine. And that she might, when she gets older, identify just as a black woman. And that mm -hmm. also would be fine. You know, she just, she's open to, who she she feels she is and who she wants to be. But the main thing is just to try and embrace, like I'm all about sort of including and being inclusive around race and identity as much as you can. And for a parent who, you know, let's say you're a white mom and your kids are mixed, you know, you are now part of that culture as far as I'm concerned. You are part of that. Like my, my, um, my mother-in-law, Helen, she is from New Zealand. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I am part New Zealand. <laughs> Even though I'm thinking it right, not. right. But, you know, my kids have a little bit of New Zealand in them, even though they've never been there. They don't, you know, but still, I just like, I identify. So you're part of that community. So you should embrace that and help your kids embrace it as well. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's so amazing. Like we just, as, as I don't know, human beings, we like, we don't let just people define themselves. Like we have a problem with that or a lot of people do, not all of us, but like, you know, whether you're, you know, trans or you're disabled or like whatever you, you know, whatever the thing is that you've decided that you, I mean, you know, that you are, um, it anyway, <laughs> it's just amazing to me that we, are still in this place and I guess probably will be, but it's, you're really giving us the tools to kind of deal with some of this. Um, another thing that I um, wanted to talk to you about was um, sort of intersectionality. And um, you told um, a good story about a Chilean American actress who raised her kids, you said bilingual and pro-immigrant. And she says, I don't beat around the bush. I straight up told them that although we are Latino in society, we are white and because we are white, uh, and because they are white care kids, they have and will have an advantage over other kids, but we can help others and stand up for others when needed. And I thought that was such an important message. And um, there's a little more to the story, I think, right? Um, if you could share that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so having raised her kids with this strong sense of um, being Latino and really proudly Chilean American, but at the same time acknowledging that her ancestry is more, I think it's Germanic, so it's like oh, right. my roots from Chile. Um, so knowing that she is white and explaining to her kids about white privilege, and um, she told this lovely story of her son being on, I think, the bus and this the bus driver was talking to a woman at the front and the woman came on and the woman didn't speak much English. And so her son, he's only 12 and he went up and he helped translate for the woman. And then he came home and he told his mom about it as well. That's what I love. Like I love that they've had these conversations and then he saw that situation and he thought I can help. You know, and he said, you know, mom, I knew, I remembered what you said and I thought how I can be helpful here. So, you know, these are the, these are the little things. Um, that's why like the book is subtitled How to Raise a Kind Child in a Prejudiced World. Cause I really just think that 
leading with kindness and all of these little incidences can make a huge difference. Yeah, that was like, that was like your example brought to life, you know? Yeah. I mean, what, here's what happens when you do talk to your kids, they will pay it forward, they will do the right thing. Um, yeah. it, I have so many questions to ask you. I'm sort of <laughs> looking at the time. So um, uh, uh, this is like, a, okay, critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just go there. I'm like, so, I, and I don't know if this is such a, it's probably not as big of a deal in the UK. It's just, it's it's sort of nuts to me that somehow this is in our conversation that you know people are pushing back on teaching um, teaching about racism in school. And I think I might get this a little bit wrong, but critical race theory is not what people are being taught necessarily, right? In it, that's like a PhD level stuff. I mean, what's being, I, you know, I think what should be taught in schools is kind of exactly what you're writing about in your book. Um, and some of these examples and the history, obviously, of um, especially here, you know, uh, the history of racism and slavery and um, being just upfront about what's going on. But I'd love your take on that since that's sort of in the news and it's about children in schools and, and all of that. Yeah, I mean, don't get me started on schools. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's just a big wild mess. And it's the same here. Like here, okay. I don't know if you read about the race report that the government commissioned, the UK government. So they commissioned um, this so-called race report. This is after all the sort of Black Lives Matter uprising since summer of 2020. And they came out with a race report, um, what well, was actually called the Sewell Report, but it's known as the race report here, basically telling us that racism was not really a thing in Britain, that, you know, that we've kind of moved beyond slavery and colonialism, that actually we should look back, you know, with positive, in a positive way, <laughs> like slavery and colonialism, and, you know, the things that we need to worry about now have nothing to do with race, it's just all about class all of this basic nonsense. And part of the thing they were saying was that you shouldn't teach race and racism in schools because it's divisive. And this is just rubbish. Like, you know, obviously the whole way to get a more inclusive society is to talk about race, is to open up, is to embrace, is to allow people to bring in their experiences and to keep this going and to start like from nursery and go all the way through university like this. So there's just a massive gap. When you look at the curriculum, you know, when I look at what I was taught about race in school, it's absolutely nothing. Or, you know, what what's being taught now to my kids, it's the same thing. They're barely learning anything about race, apart from the same kind of tired narratives about, oh, Britain ended slavery you know, Martin Luther King did, you know, like Martin Luther King has become right. a kind of like mascot <laughs> and people like ignore all of the really radical things that he said about race and all right. you know, about challenging like white liberalism and all this stuff. And they just go, like, oh, Martin Luther King and then carry <laughs> on. So it's like, it's all about control and containment. And it's really like the government trying to control and to contain the story because they're fearful of what will happen when people learn the truth. But actually our children need the truth. You know, my Anjali right. said, tell the truth to yourself first and to the children. It's so important. We need it because we need accountability before we can actually move forward as a society. So um, yeah, it just, it, it does my head in that they're banning critical race theory in certain states. They're literally banning it which just tells you how fearful they are. Yeah, it does, it does. And it, I, I am hopeful that it won't, that you know, people will disseminate that information in those states where they're banning it and it will not hold ultimately. I mean, it's like they're trying to dam up a situation that is not not in their control. And you know, it's, it's we're gonna evolve, things are gonna, you know, and I, anyway, yeah. Well, I mean, the beauty probably. of the internet and the beauty of sort of, modern this modern age is that you can learn stuff on your own you know you can educate right. yourself and you can educate your kids there's a lot of um 
sort of small networks of parents and families, like black families who sort of do Saturday schools and, you know, um, networks who do like uh, anti-racist book clubs or anti-racist homeschool. There's so many different ways you can just teach yourself this stuff. Unfortunately, <laughs> apparently the mainstream education is not gonna cut it so far. Yeah. Um, I am going to dig into our questions from the audience. And if you have any questions, definitely put them in where it says, ask a question at the bottom there. Um, Liz asks, how can we talk to young children about racism without scaring them? Yeah, <laughs> um, this is one that, uh, question that comes up a lot because sometimes people think, oh, I shouldn't bring up racism at all because you know, I don't want to scare them or I don't want to like corrupt their innocence. Right. You know? And unfortunately, your child has been born into a racist society, so their innocence is already corrupted. It's just very unfortunate. <laughs> That's the situation. Right. All of us, you know, absolutely every single one of us has been conditioned into a white supremacist society that we have to now detangle and sort of de uncondition our, our mentality. So when you're talking to a very young child, you want to talk about it. It depends on how old your child is, but if they're really, really young, um, I think you can talk about fairness, which is something that really little kids understand. You know, they understand what is fair and what is not fair. They understand what is kind and what is not kind. So you can talk about, you know, if you're talking about, um, for instance, the, the murder of George Floyd, you don't have to come at them and tell them, you know, uh, be graphic <laughs> and be like, right, right. somebody was murdered in the street and all this stuff. You can just say, you know, a, a man was hurt and he was innocent, but he was killed. You can talk about him being killed. And you can talk about the fact that people all over the world have risen up to say, this is wrong, this is not fair, and we have to do better. So just keep it simple and focus on stuff that they understand. Don't fill them with graphic imagery or sort of language, but be truthful, be as truthful, truthful as you can in the moment. Yep. Um, Emily asks, my daughter is Japanese American and I am white. I struggle with how to handle racist microaggressions against her at school. My instinct is to charge into the school to complain to the principal and my daughter always, uh, the principal and my daughter always strongly insists she doesn't want me to. What are some ideas for how I can intervene and how to talk to my daughter about these incidents? Thank you. Yeah, um, is your daughter, like, is she, I don't know what age she is. Is she sort of old enough, I guess, to say that she doesn't want you coming into the school? She's um, 15, she just 15. put in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's worth just having an ongoing conversation with your daughter about uh, a culture change that needs to happen at the school and the fact that it's really, really important to stand up to racism at any point that you can. So I can understand that she might not want the attention. She might feel like, you know, it will come back on her in some way, maybe, you know, and a lot of parents have this fear, which is a very valid fear, but at the same time, um, it needs to be addressed and it's really important so you can talk about different strategies that you might want to use. For instance, whether you just want to write a letter to the school. Um, I'd say any kind of racism that's happening in school, try and keep some kind of written record. And if you're right, you know, write to the school, write to the teacher, write to the head, you know, keep escalating it until somebody responds because it's not okay. And racism needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be addressed uh, with your daughter. You could possibly watch shows together in which people stand up to racism just to kind of inspire her. Obviously she's 15, so, you know, you have to sort of be led by what she wants to an extent, but I think just keep having that conversation and see if you can persuade her that this is something that's important, not just for her, but for other kids, because guaranteed if she's experiencing this, then other children are too, or will do in, in future. Um, that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, when you say, so here's a, you have a lot of good bon mots in this, uh, in this book. When you say, um, race is not a fact, it's a feeling. Can you talk more about that? What you mean? 
Yeah, I mean, race is is a fiction. It's it's a construct. You know, it's something that was made up, um, and it was made up for very specific reasons. You know, to hold power and to hold money and to hoard opportunity and to dominate and to conquer. And unfortunately, this fiction is something that dominates the world. At the same time, it's, you know, it's a feeling like the way you feel as a black person is different depending on where you are in the world, who you are, where you come from, the way you feel as a white person is different depending on your particular lived experiences. So I think it's, it's something to always bear in mind because sometimes people get so caught up in the whole race and, you know, how do we deal with race? And, I, you know, remember that this is not... <laughs> It's, we made it up. <laughs> we just made it up. You know, and we're all the same. Like since we've made it up and we're here, you know, let's tell ourselves a better story around race. Like let's have a more positive narrative around race. You know, let's change it and let's own it in a way that's, you know, that includes people and makes people feel validated. Right. Um, one of the um one of the great things too, you have a lot of resources at the end of your book and um, Robin, I believe just asked, uh, you mentioned showing kids TV shows where the characters stand up to race and racism. Do you have any suggestions for those shows? Um, oh God. <laughs> that would be hard off the top of your head, but yeah. I have a really good list on my blog actually. So if you go to babesabouttown.com and um, you click on the, the bringing up race section on babesabouttown.com, you'll find like a whole list of TV, you know, what to watch with your kids to spark conversations around race. And there's, you know, there's tons of films and TV shows um, for, for different ages as well, like from preschooler to teenager. Um, Birgit, sounds like Margaret, Birgit, answer, uh, asked, um, how do you deal with the outrage of the blatant disregard for truth resulting in absurd theories that have become commonplace? Sorry, I didn't quite. How do yeah, I deal with so how do you deal with the outrage of the blatant disregard for truth resulting in absurd theories? I think, you know, like sort of like um, yeah, just any of these Fox News theories, you know, there's just this kind of disregard for facts, disregard for um history and what's come before and not wanting to brush it under the rug and not address things head on. So how what's a way that we can deal with that when we're faced with QAnon and people just creating just crazy stuff, it's crazy stuff. Yeah, I, I say like, you know, for me, like obviously I've written a book and I'm out here talking and I will engage and I will try to educate and I will continue to educate myself. But at the same time, like uh, one of my relatives the other day, she was, you know, she was like, oh, how do I explain to somebody, you know, that when they say, when I, I say Black Lives Matter and they tell me all lives matter, you know, how do I explain to them that I don't think that all lives don't matter? You know, and I said to her, listen, whoever you're trying to explain this to knows. They already, they understand this. Like, it's not a difficult thing. In, in bringing up race, I explain it so you can explain it to a small child and they get it. So, you know, it's not a tricky thing. The reason they're responding in that way is just because of racism or it's just because mm -hmm. they've decided, they've chosen that narrative. So I say on some level, conserve your energy, you know, <laughs> put your energy where it's needed most. If you have the time to engage with somebody who wants to, you know, spin off into some weird sphere, then fine, you know, engage as, as much as you can, but conserve your energy, focus on where you can change, you know, how you can grow, um, the conversations you can have with the people who matter. So that's my response. <laughs> that's great. Great advice. Um, what do you, um, so it's, by the way, it's midnight, was now it's probably like almost it 10 a.m., right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so appreciative of you doing this. It's so late in, over there in London, um, over the, across the pond. Um, what's next for you? What are you working on now? Yeah, so I'm in the middle of, um, I've got another book idea that I'm working on, sort of pitching and pitch mode for that. And I am, um, 
I've written another book, I can't really talk about it yet, but it's, it's something quite lovely. And yeah, I'm just doing my thing, blogging, <laughs> <laughs> writing, <laughs> yeah. speaking, yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm sure you're on a, you're on tour. Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I think, uh, Robin, should we bring you back up for the final bit here? Sure. May I toggle you? I'm coming up. Okay, and I've got the sunlight on my face. <laughs> I don't know why I bothered with this other light. Um, thank you for a really powerful conversation, Uju and Margaret. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience did too and anybody who watches the replay. And I, and I did wanna mention um, for those of you who are watching live, um, feel free to share this with others. They can they can watch the replay. They can you know find out more about tonight and Uju's book. And if you really wanna get fancy, um, there's a little thing at the bottom on the lower left that says clip moment and you can pull like your favorite part and share it on social. Okay, so um, wanted to also share all of the wonderful upcoming events that we have. Um, so next Wednesday, we have a workshop that's called Secrets to a Career Change, and that is included in your um, two-night membership. And it is going to be uh, featuring Keisha TK Dutess, who uh, used to be a nurse, and now she's an audio producer. She's um, been featured on NPR. She's worked on Roxanne Gay's podcast. So that is going to be next Wednesday, June 16th at 7 p.m. And if you took my storytelling class, uh, you know she's a riot and she's awesome. Um, so she's going to be doing that for us next Wednesday. In uh, uh, two weeks after that, on June 29th, uh, Marga is going to be talking with uh, Kristen Van Ogtrop about Midlife Indignities, and that's another two-night or tea at 7 p.m. Uh, everything is Eastern time. Then in July, we've got such fun programming. We've got two-night or tea with Theo Kogan from The Luna Chicks and Jeannie Fury, who is a uh, music journalist, and they're going to be talking about their book called Fallopian Rhapsody, the story of the Luna Chicks, and that's going to be Tuesday. So our two night, so two night or teas are on Tuesday, and then our workshops and courses are on Wednesdays. Uh, that's July thirteenth at seven. We're doing an, uh, the following night, July fourteenth. We're doing uh, a workshop organizing your digital photos with a professional organizer. September, we're doing a four week course on online dating. And this, um, this were Margaret and I are like really, ex I mean, we're excited about all of it, but in October and November, we think this is a really um, important course that we're gonna be offering for six weeks. And it's all about writing death documents. Um, and that the woman we have engaged for that is really smart, really knows her stuff and has really smart and um, strategies for writing your own death documents and, and so much more. And then in December, and this is just a, a taste of what we've got going on, but in December, we're going to be talking about seasonal affective disorder with um, psychologist, Dr. Elfie, who's a mental health expert. So there is a link below uh, that you can see here. Join us at twonighters.com to find out all of the information for that. And so I hope that we see you next week and at some of the upcoming events. So. I will and, turn it back to you. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's it. That's it. Thank you for going through all that. And yeah, yeah we have and, a calendar on <laughs> twonighters.com. You can find all of this um, and uh, all of this there too. And um, Uju, I just want to thank you so much for such a great conversation. Um, I learned a ton. I mean, I learned a ton reading your book and just talking to you. And I feel like we could talk for another hour <laughs> like, at least. <laughs> And I'm super excited for whatever you have next because this was like just everybody you really have to get this book. It's so good. Like I said, I'm not a parent, but it was I, I learned a lot. And um, here's to ants. So actually, do you have any advice for ants? <laughs> Aunt <laughs> Well, I, I think, you know, I love that I'm an aunt as well. And I think, you know, you're in a great position because you can just go for it. Like be more open with your conversations, say the stuff that your your um that their parents are maybe a little hesitant to say or a little worried to say, you know, share the experiences that that your parents have not yet shared. So yeah. That's my, my advice, That's you know, good. do your auntie thing. <laughs> I get to spoil them and I get to, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and um, 
let's see, we want to, we've got the link to your blog. We've got all the information. Thank you, Robin, for putting it up there and how to buy the book um, and how to follow Uju. Um, follow us at, at tonight on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, we are tonight.com and we are, that is for our stories and for our community, we are tonighters.com, which is the link in the middle of your screen. Um, yeah, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Uju, so much. Um, and thank you, audience, for joining us tonight. It's, I love, I love seeing all the chat during the conversation. It's really great. And thanks for your questions. And uh, we hope to see you at one of our upcoming events soon. So thank you all so much. And hopefully not, let's not let wait 20 years again. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I'll be able to get out there. Like when things <laughs> open up, I can, I can yes, travel. Yes, please. Yes. Or I'll, maybe I'll co go visit you in London. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, Talk to you later. Bye. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>